the Lord, everybody. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. I uh, got up this morning and I was thinking as I was getting dressed to come in here today and uh, thinking about my mom, thinking about my wife, everything that they went through, I have each and every one of us is in this place. And I'm going to tell you right now, mothers are special. I thank God for mothers, amen. I thank you for creating a mom because they have compassion, Brother David, that I don't have. So all you dads that are in this place, why don't we just give these moms a hand clap and thank God and praise him for making moms. Can we do that? Now let's just turn that all, everybody turn it to the Lord and give him some praise and some honor in this place today because he is the one that is worthy of all of our praise. Come on, lift your voices and magnify the Lord in this place this morning. I'll praise him in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. I'll praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numb. I'll praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the wild.
think we, I think we need to understand what our praise can do. Because when the, when the enemy is on us on a Monday and a Tuesday, we can come in here on a Wednesday and we can just start to praise him. We can start worshiping him. We can dance in the middle of our situation. I can glorify the Lord because I know the devil is already lost. We are growing, church. We are on the winning team. We have the Savior that is, we have the name that is above every name. And it says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't know what you're going through, but I can tell you right now, a little bit of dancing, a little bit of praising, a little bit of worship in the name of the Lord. We can come out of our situation. We can overcome the things that the, the, the enemy is telling us that we're going to sink in. I want to praise him even on the mountain, and I want to praise him in the valley. I want to praise him when everything is going wrong in my life, because that's the time that I need him the most, is when everything ain't all right. That's when I need him to show up in my life the most, is when I'm in that valley, and everything is looking like it's just going all kinds of crazy. But I know he's going to show up because I have faith that he is just and he can do exceedingly and above all that we can think by the powers that work within us. That power is the Holy Ghost. And if you don't have it, you need it. It is here today and it can change your life. I'm thankful for it. We can get the ways to give on the board. We got Givelify. We got PayPal and RiverbendPentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Text to give, 833-883-9311. If you have faith today, and you know the Lord can work through all prayers, won't you say this prayer with me today in faith? Upon the authority of the word I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved, serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name, amen. Come and give. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been the poor man in the fire time after time. Born of his spirit, lost in his
the Lord. And he heard. And he answered. Come on, I still believe it. I still believe he hears. And not only do I still believe he hears, I still believe he answers. Brother Terrence, you're right. A little worship, a little praise changes things. The Bible talks about Paul and Silas being in the prison. And they cried out unto the Lord because the enemy had plans to kill them. And their praise changed their destiny. Their praise changed things around. I'm telling somebody in this room, your praise can change everything. Come on, the enemy's telling you praise ain't going to change nothing. But the thing about Paul and Silas, they called out at midnight. It was at the darkest moment they began to call on the Lord. And he heard and he answered. He will never fail. We're going into a time of prayer. And that scripture also says that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. They didn't just praise, but they prayed. And I'm believing when we pray, there's going to be some foundations shape. There's going to be some situations turn around. Come on, somebody, you got to get a hold of it. Somebody's got to get a hold and just touch the hem of his garment. Somebody's got to press through the darkness. Somebody's got to press through the crowd. He's in this room. So we're going to pray, and there's going to be some foundation shake. There's going to be some doors open. Let's just seek him. Whatever's on your heart, just seek him. Will you just seek him with me, Lord? We love you. One thing we're after. One thing we seek, Lord, and it's just your presence. God, it's your direction. It's your counsel. It's your mind. God, we need you. We're truly nothing without you, God. Our, our flesh can be weak. Our mind can be weak. But, God, your spirit can change things. God, I, I believe, Lord, that sickness is not too big. A uh, uh, family's broken apart. It's not too big. God, the darkness, the midnight hour, God, it's not too big for you. Lord, you're bigger than time. You're bigger than science. God, I, I believe that you can move in this place. I, I believe that there's, there's going to be some lives changed in this place today because we have access to that only saving name. Lord, neither is there salvation in any other. Lord, there's healing in your name. There's direction in your name. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. And your word says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I call on that sweet name. I call on the name above every name. I call on the name of Jesus. Lord, over every distraction. Lord, over every hurt. Everything, God. It's in your name. It's in your name. In Jesus' name.
trying to hurt nobody's feelings or nothing but I hear what people say out there I ain't going down there there's a bunch of hypocrites let me tell you why they think there's a bunch of hypocrites because when they come because it's a special Sunday you don't worship because it's a special Sunday some of my kin people might be here somebody might see me they might see me out on TV there is a spirit in this room right now of obstinance that's got to come down. Jesus is here, and when Jesus comes into the room, there's only one response. Holy, 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 holy!
And the angels cried, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And Brother Larry, there's not been one angel forgiven of their sins. There's not been one angel who has been healed when they laid hands on the sick. There's not one angel who has come and left and come back and God was still as merciful as he was the first time. But we have, we have, we have, we have, we have. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 14. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. I'm very grateful for my mama. I'm just very grateful for my mama. Grateful for my mother-in-law. Especially grateful for my wife, who is the mother of my children, of our children. Last year, I preached just a piece of rope. I gave out a piece of red rope to all the ladies. And the world changed after that service. been heavy on my mind. She's been heavy on my mind. I got a word from the Lord, but I'm scared to preach it. But somebody here, it's going to mean something. I, I think it's for everybody. But there's one person in particular in this house that you're going to get something from this word nobody else is going to get. Because it's going to speak to you right where you are. And I challenge you to respond the way you know to respond. Hope everybody has a great day. We have some gifts for you afterwards. If you're able and willing and would stand in honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. I forgot to pick John Stanley. Take care of getting rid of them presents for me, boy. Now, baby, I asked somebody. <laughs> These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And then he says, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I want to speak to you for a few moments today. And regardless of how I approach the pulpit, I'm not angry this morning. Matter of fact, I'm happy. My mama's still with me. Tomorrow, my mama will be 71 years old. She, she has the unfortunate privilege of having her birthday right by Mother's Day, so sometimes that gets in the way. It's a good day today. God is moving. We're having revival. Yes. You see all these different altar calls we have, every service yes. happens all the time. That's the way we roll now. If you need something from God, step out, go get it. But I am under a sense of urgency today. I'm not forecasting, prophesying doom and gloom upon anybody. 
But I am telling you, it won't be long till Jesus comes. Watched a message this week. One of our preachers, Bishop Art Wilson, recently given diplomatic status in the United Nations, which means he can walk through any airport in the United States of America. Nobody can stop him. Nobody can check his luggage. He preaches at the United Nations at least twice a week, if not three times. They have a map on the wall of the United Nations, calendar on it. And it ends in 2030. He asked the Secretary General, what does that mean? And he said, everything is going to change by 2030. I don't know what that means, but I can tell you, you watch Israel, and you read the Bible, and you can figure out real fast, quick, and in a hurry, game playing time is over. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. I want to speak to you for a few moments today on the way he gives, the way he gives. Pray with me before you're seated. God, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. You are my redeemer, my savior, my everything. You are holy, you are pure, you are righteous, you are perfect. Your way is perfect. I believe, Lord Jesus, that you are going to minister in this house today. I pray that you will anoint me to deliver this word that you've given me. It's different, but it's right on time. It's right at somebody. I pray they will have the courage. I pray they will have the honesty to respond. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. God bless you. Thank you again for coming. Please don't leave without your present. In the late 1800s, 1868 to be exact, several groups of women were formed into something they called peace groups. And they actually tried to establish holidays and had regular activities where they declared they were for peace and against war. Now I might add in, this has nothing to do with my message today and it's probably just going to serve to make some people upset. But very quickly after they began Mother's Day, they became disillusioned with Mother's Day because people started giving gifts and giving cards, and that's not what it was about. You can read it for yourself. The first Mother's Day in the United States, although it was not an official holiday until 1911, the first Mother's Day in the United States observed that we have a record of was in 1868. It was a gathering of the mothers of soldiers who fought and many died in the Civil War. It was in effect a gathering of mothers coming together petitioning that no more husbands or sons be killed. Appealing to both sides of the Civil War as it were from those most affected by the Civil War, by the death of the soldiers, which was their mamas. In the Civil War, it is well documented that father fought against son and brother against brother and families were radically divided, not just ideologically, but in actuality as they fought in battles against each other. Ann Jarvis, credited with the creation of these gatherings, these peace groups, desired to bring these ladies together for the express purpose of reuniting, God help me, of reuniting these divided families, thereby bringing peace to our country. What a concept. Uh, I'm going to preach just a minute, but I'm going to tell you, we got to stop watching the news and going home and bellyaching to our family. 
we got to start with our families and get our families back to praying together, get our families back to reading the Bible together. Because if you're going to do anything to help this country, it's going to start under your roof. It's not going to start at the voting polls. It's not going to start at the protest rallies. It's going to start around your dinner table. Providing you have a dinner table. If you don't, you need to get one. Although gathering folks together in smaller groups desiring to bring about change, uniting toward a common goal is found throughout history. People coming together trying to make a difference is found throughout history. There is no record in any historical uh, medium showing movement toward a predetermined outcome, no progression, no direction toward a worldwide collaborative effort because everybody's got their own agenda, everybody's got their own plan, everybody is passionate about one thing and another is not. There is nowhere in the history of the world that the entire embodiment of people would come together for a common goal. That is, except in the Bible. The Word of God, bringing nations, kingdoms, and cultures, working toward a singular goal. From Genesis to Revelations, it's one story having one ending written by one author who is not of this earth but is of the heavens, divine. And there is one ultimate purpose throughout the Bible, and that is reconciliation, bringing mankind back to their created purpose, which was relationship with God. And when we get things right with God, we get things right with our marriage and get things right with our families and get things right in all of our relationships. I, woo, I think the book says that God can make a man's enemies even be at peace with him. The first step that anyone must take toward reconciliation, and I might add recovery, is to get things right with God. Amen. With the fall of man through the sinful behaviors of Adam and Eve, the relationship between God and man was destroyed. Don't think it was just a little wounded. Don't think they just got in a little trouble. It was destroyed. Man left his place a place, men, in which he was only subservient to God. Man was created that all the other creation, he would live in dominion over it. Man was created to be in dominion over the animals. Man was created to be in dominion over the rivers and over the streams and even over the mountains, Brother David. The only creation, the only being that man was beneath was God. But when sin came in, he felt like he got his own way and he felt like he went his own way and he felt like he got everything right because now he could do what he wanted to. But unfortunately, Brother Jerry, he bowed down and began to worship sin itself. And when he started worshiping the wrong God, everything bucked and rose up against him. And then man, man began to have to break the ground, Brother David. The ground wouldn't work with him anymore, but it worked against him. And nobody in the history of the world has ever had to plant weeds to get them to grow. Boy, I wish I could preach. Man, I wish I could preach. If y'all all wasn't scared of your mama getting upset or great aunt Lucille getting upset or whatever, we could have some church up in here. But we got to realize that the first thing that we're going to have to do into getting our life right is we're going to have to repent and we're going to have to stop sinning and we're going to have to stop bucking against the word of God because sin is the problem. It's always been the problem, Brother Blake, and it's always going to be the problem. Amen. Jesus, Holy Ghost, help me right now. Jesus came preaching, excuse me, John the Baptist came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Jesus bust on the, floor, on the scene, Brother David, he preached the same message. I want to inspire you and I want to make you get to bumping and thumping and popping your neck and getting your shoulders bouncing and all that stuff. But if anything else, I can get you to repent. Yep. You can't. 
You can't keep on sinning and hope to get your life right. Man who was created to live in dominion became the servant of sin. Inclinations born and nurtured by an intrusive nature to which man was originally a stranger. A violation of the peaceful dominion, the order, the order, Brother Kevin, the order that God created was violated because man wanted to do his own thing. The struggle was born, and as we mentioned last week, with every baby that's ever been born in the history of the world, there's an ever-present, undeniable desire that there's more than this. For every mountain we climb in the world, for every race we win, for every treasure we find, we are very soon shocked into the reality that it did not do for us what we thought it would. With the fall of man through the sinful behaviors of Adam and Eve, the relationship between God and man was destroyed. It was into this cauldron of unfulfilled, undefined desire. That's what makes people fight one another. That's what makes Cain rise up and kill Abel. That's what makes people decide to build a tower and try to beat out God because they got something in them that they can't find an answer to. They got something in them. And rather, and rather than turn back to the one that put you here, rather than turn back to the one that has the answers, uh, we still begin still, 6,000 plus years later, we still looking for answers in all the wrong places. It was into this cauldron. A cauldron. That's the witch's pot. That's what the world was. This cauldron, this big mixed up, slopped up mess of life that an angel spoke to a young lady named Mary. She was already engaged to be married to a carpenter named Joseph. She was a godly young woman, clean and pure, and she has saved herself for her husband. And the angel said unto her, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying. And she began to think in her mind, what exactly is he talking about? And the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary. Fear not, Mary. Has anybody ever thought about this? They know my name in heaven. Ooh, I feel Holy Ghost in here right now. You thought you were hiding. You thought you could set off in a corner somewhere. You thought you could not respond. You could not raise a ruckus. And you'd get some points for showing up on Mother's Day. Surprise. Jesus Christ, Lord God Almighty, knew you when you woke up this morning. He knew you when you got your coffee. He knew when you combed your hair. He knew when you slid off in your car. And he knew when you sneaked in here. He said, Mary, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And it is with this declaration that the fulfillment of man's highest desire, can I tell you, undefined desire. He knew he needed something, Brother David, but he didn't know what it was. He knew something was missing. But with the angel's declaration, this undefined desire has the first rays of hope of being fulfilled. It's to a troubled nation that he comes, humbled under the shadow of a ruling country that galled them to their very core. But due to the inadequacies of money, power, and leadership, 
They have remained submitted to Roman rule. And as divisive as Jesus' ministry was, and it was divisive, as divisive as Jesus' ministry was, there was an area that he and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the publicans and the sinners, they all agreed we're in a place we don't belong. Serving a ruler we don't belong serving to. For most, freedom from Roman rule through no less than a revival of a heavenly demonstration was the ultimate. They knew that God's hand was upon Israel in the time of Abraham. Through Joseph, they were blessed in the time of famine. The word of the land as they came out of Egypt was, when Israel shows up, they will experience victory and we will be defeated because they have a God who fights for them. The children of Israel experienced the hand of God through Gideon and Samson. David rose up and led them to victory and a status as a powerful nation on the wings of stepping out to slay a giant who had previously terrorized an entire army. They knew of God's hand upon Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah. And they knew for sure that someday the favor of God would come and rest upon them again and the world would know just who the chosen people of God was. But when he came, he showed up to an audience of one, the fiancé of a lowly carpenter, nobody from nowhere. There was a pregnancy validated when her little belly began to swell and the promised Messiah was on the way, but it was just a blip, if you will, on the radar of humanity. We hear little of him in Bethlehem. That's where he was born. He spent a little time in Egypt. Had one visit we know of to Jerusalem, but spent most of his time in Nazareth until he's 30 years old. Beginning with turning the water into wine in Cana, followed by numerous supernatural miracles, Signs and wonders, deaf ears unstopped, blind eyes open, lame legs restored, leprosy cleansed, devils cast out, thousands fed with just one little small lunch, and of course, the dead raised to life. While showing no signs of being a military leader, no signs of being a strategic leader, Jesus has definitely brought something to these people they've never seen before. Matter of fact, they say it, never man spake like this man. We've never seen it done like this before. But he is always, from the beginning of his ministry, he has always spoke of the time he would leave them. They're caught up in the glow of the miraculous and the unexplainable and they never seemed to catch hold of what he was saying. But there would come a time when he would no longer be with them. Physically, of course. But anything less than him being with them was unsatisfactory. They have experienced a reprieve from the oppressive weight of Roman rule. And although the rule remained Herod was still in charge. Caesar was still in charge. But Brother David, as long as they had Jesus, it just didn't seem to matter no more. It was a life they had become accustomed to living. It was waking up and experiencing miracles, signs, and wonders every day. It was waking up, sitting with him on the side of the mountain and listening to him teach. It was waking up every day and he would come out of the mountain where he had been praying. But they walked with him. They talked with him. They lived with him. Jesus was their comforter every day. Now they're at the Last Supper. Judas has allowed Satan to enter into him and the process of betrayal has begun. And Jesus washes their feet. Oh, what a Savior. He said, and you do for one another as I've done to you. Serve the most menial act of service. And then he shares the wine and the bread with them and then according to John's gospel, he began to speak to him. Tonight, our text was in John 14. And he starts off with, 
Many of you could quote it, no doubt. Let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> Following comes perhaps better known phrases as, in my father's house are many mansions, which always catches our ear, especially if we haven't had the privilege of living in a mansion down here. Yeah. It's going to be different, right? <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Build my mansion next door to Jesus. It's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful song. But we automatically relegated mansions to heaven because when we got started, there wasn't nobody living in a mansion. And the only hope we had of living in a mansion was to go to heaven. Right? It is. Then he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. People remember it. We read it at funerals. We read it at weddings. We read it in church services. But beginning with verse 25, his departure became more real. Because he says in verse 25, and I haven't really been preaching yet. I've just been kind of laying a foundation. So if you felt something or you got a tingle or you stood up and clapped, that was all don't count. He said, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet with you. I've been telling you, man, Holy Ghost. What I've been teaching you, what I've been telling you is about being with you. But verse 26 says, but something different's about to happen. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, I don't have time to go off into that, but who's talking? Jesus. And he said, the Holy Ghost is coming in my name. Yeah. Hmm. That's why Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other, Brother Blake. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But look at here. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I said unto you while I was with you. And then he says something, verse 27. Is it all going to be up there? Yeah, because this is where this whole message came from. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Notice there's a colon there, which denotes the ending of a thought. And then he says, which there wasn't any punctuation in the original translation. It just works for us today. But then he says, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So while I was reading this, and this is how it works with me. I don't know how it works with you. But while I'm reading this, when the Lord wants to speak to me something out of his word, the words he wants me to read get like this tall. It happens. I'll be just like reading, you know, and all of a sudden there's a big billboard. And I know that the Lord is saying, got something there for you, hoss. So this time it was not as the world giveth, Give I unto you. Well, now, in my way of thinking, for years and years and years, long as I've been reading this, my way of thinking, Brother Shannon, was he was saying, I'm going to give you peace like the world can't give you. My peace I give you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. But when the Lord made it in big old letters for me, I realized he wasn't just talking about peace. He was talking about how he gives. And don't make the mistake of assuming that when, that when I give you something, it's given the same way the world gives it. Don't make the mistake of assuming that I wait till Mother's Day to throw a gift on you. Don't assume that I let somebody else dictate when the gift giving time is. Don't assume that the gifts I have are given to you because you deserve them. Don't assume that I am giving things to you just like the world gives it. Unfortunately, we often make that assumption. 
But I came to tell you, be happy. Because it's in an obscure place here. But this phrase jumped out at me, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. I always thought he was talking about peace, but he's not talking about peace. He's talking about how he gives. Jesus is encouraging his disciples. They are perplexed. They have left all to follow him. And now he's leaving them. And Brother Shannon, it looks like he's leaving them with nothing. They put all their eggs in that basket, Brother Larry. They have given everything. Peter said it. The Lord agreed. We gave up everything. And until now, they ain't never regretted following him because it's been a pretty good life. Plenty of groceries, water in the wine. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Whole time we're handing out fish and bread, we're dipping in the supply. Peter's mom in law was sick. God raised her back to life. They get to be with him all the time. But now all of a sudden he's leaving, Brother Blake. And what about us, partner? What about us? Is there any kind of life lived? Is there any kind of living life left for us without Jesus in it? But he said, when I give gifts, I don't give them like the world gives them. Because in this case, he said, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to leave peace with you. But it's my peace. Now, our peace is the absence of turmoil. But Jesus had peace in the middle of turmoil. He said, I don't give things like the world gives them. How is it that the world gives? Think about this. Where did that idea even come from, giving gifts to one another? What is it that propels us to want to give something to somebody? Well, there's a message we want to convey. You matter. There's an ultimate purpose of giving gifts, but what is it? Surely we don't just give gifts because the government gave us a holiday. What's the true motivation behind us giving gifts? Y'all don't make me get all up in your business, but I don't mind it. I promise you it wasn't going in hock all year long so you could buy your baby a Christmas present or ten. That wasn't God's plan. What's the true motivation behind the way we give gifts? Is it because we love them? Is it because that we know they expect us to give them a gift at this time? Is it because that we're afraid of being ashamed because we didn't give when everybody else was giving? You know there's some folks in here that came back to school off Christmas break and you made up a list of gifts you got that you ain't never even seen nowhere except in the catalog. Because all them other kids were saying, I got this and I got this and I got this and you didn't. But by the time you got through telling your story, you did. Y'all know good and well there's peer pressure connected to giving gifts. How many times do we give gifts because we're afraid they're going to be mad if we don't? <laughs> Truth is, at any time, any of these things, right now while I'm preaching, everybody in here is saying, oh, I just love them so much. That's why I give gifts. <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. I knew that wasn't true when Christmas time came around and we bought Mama something and we bought Carol something. But one of them cost a few dollars less, and we had to buy them just a little something to make it even. Y'all yeah. yeah. know what I'm talking about. Yeah. We got a messed up thinking about gift giving, and unfortunately, we have thrown that same paradigm on the Lord. Yeah. As if he gives. 
Oh, I'm causing trouble. I'm about to. That's why somebody can get up and God can use them. And they don't look like you think they ought to look like. They ain't been acting like you think they ought to look, act like. And you did not realize that the Lord didn't run everything by you before he gifted somebody. He's supposed to ask my permission before he uses them. Where in the world did that come from? That came from our messed up thinking about giving. Because I'm going to tell you right now. You give to somebody who acts like a chump when you give it to them and they don't even say thank you and they don't even act appreciative. They ain't getting a gift next time. And I'm going to stand flat-footed and tell you, the Lord has gifted me when I didn't deserve it. The Lord has gifted me when it wasn't the right time for me. The Lord has gifted me because he had a plan for my life. The Lord has gifted me because somebody needed something that I was in a position to give them. I want to tell you, I feel the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you right now, I'm so happy that the Lord don't think like you think. And I'm so happy that the Lord don't think like I think. But he's got a different set of standards. Oh, this is good preaching. Let me tell you something. He's got a whole life invested in making sure you get it right. He shed his precious blood to make sure you get it right. Your little old sissy five penny any mistakes don't intimidate the Lord. Your outlandish failure don't intimidate the Lord. He died to set you free from that. Baby, why didn't you remind me this was Mother's Day? I would have behaved a whole lot more sane. Look at this. Y'all ain't ready for this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. James chapter 1, verse 16, 17. Do not err, my beloved brethren. You better get this right, he said. Make no mistake, he said. We're fixing to lay it out plain for you, he said. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Next verse. Every, every good gift and every, I'm going somewhere with this. The good part ain't over. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Now, if you study this, you'll find out that the first gift comes from one Greek word and the second gift comes from another Greek word. Now, unfortunately, both of those words are translated gift into English. But Brother David, the first gift, somebody's going to get this, the first gift is called the act of giving, the very idea of giving. The second gift is the gift. Y'all didn't get it. You know what? The, let me tell you what it says. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. The act of giving and the gift is from above. You know where we learned how to give gifts? He showed us. You didn't learn how to give gifts from your mama or your grandma, or your great-grandma, you learn how to give gifts because the Lord started giving them out. The very idea of giving came from his mind, not ours. But we've taken it, and we've given it a measurement system, and we've perverted it. Yes, we have, and we've changed it all up to become something that fits us and makes us happy. But the very idea of giving gifts wasn't ours. Came from above. And the gift you give, I work for what I got. Don't play games with God. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
If you've got enough cash to lay down for some nice gifts, you can rest assured you better be saying thank you, Jesus, when you pay for it. Thank you, Jesus, when you bring it home. Thank you, Jesus, when you give it to your kids. And you better let your kids know this is not possible without him. I roll Wigner behind. I show up, give something nice to my kids. I act like I did it. Because I know, Brother Cody, they're going to love me more if it's nicer. I'm 51 years old, and I still ain't figured out that ain't true. Mama, they love a pat on the back. They love an I love you. They love a hug a whole lot more than they love some thing. And if they don't, it's because you taught them where the value was. I'm trying, Brother Walter, but it's hard today. This lines up with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This was, it was his idea. This was his plan. Oh, I feel the anointings. The Lord's ministering to somebody. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, 38. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. But unto every one of us is given grace. That was Ephesians 2 and 8. This is Ephesians 4 and 7. But unto every one of us is given grace. Everybody say grace. grace. Every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. First Peter 4 and 10, as every man hath received the gift, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as you have received the gift. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. Matter of fact, wasn't even my idea. The Lord came up with this idea and he came up with this gift and all he did was put a desire in me for it. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Hear me. Say, I got it. And now I'm called to give it. In Romans chapter 11, I'm coming to a close. Don't go to the piano yet, but I'm just coming to the close. That's one time, Garrison. I can count two. In Romans chapter number 11, we get a picture of God's never-ending love toward Israel. His desire for grace and mercy. He never desired judgment. Judgment only came to get people to come around to God's way of thinking. Israel's his chosen people. Make no mistake, they still are. They still are. They have time after time trampled his mercy up to and including crying, crucify him. Let his blood be upon our head and the head of our children. But make no mistake, Paul is clear. God doesn't think nor does he respond like man does. The Bible tells us very plainly, I don't have time to go into it all, but it tells us very plainly that since Israel rejected him, we, the Gentiles, are given the opportunity we have for salvation to come to us. But that was all a part of God's plan. Now, ma'am, I'm ministering to you right now. You know who you are. Hear me. One rejection of the gift of God 
resulted in another receiving that same gift. I could preach right here, Brother Shannon, but I'm not going to. But let me tell you what that's just like. That's just like, and a certain man made a great dinner, and he sent out invitation to all of his homies, to all of his crowd. And he said, Brother Blake, come go with me. Brother Kevin, come go with me. Sister Dana, come go. Brother Terrence, come go. Brother Colton, come go. Brother Tripp, come go. Dapper Dan, come go. That's Brother Christian. And the Bible says, Brother David, that every last one of them said, man, I got, I got something else to do. I'll get you next time. Got a wife. We get to take off all year and we got a wife. That was the rule. Got a new yoke of oxen. I got to try them out. Got a piece of land. I got to go check it out. Can't come. And the Bible said, he ticked him off. And he, when the servant came back and said, man, ain't nobody coming. He said, oh, somebody is. He said, you go out into the highways and the byways and you compel them to come because there's plenty of room for whoever you can get here. That's what we're talking about. Somebody said, too busy, too tired, worked too hard, had too many kids, can't afford to feed them. Got my wife and the music's too loud. We don't come no more. Y'all switch from pews to chairs, don't like them, ain't coming no more. That pain on the wall kind of just caused a twitch in my eye. I ain't coming no more. You put the services on TV, compromise, ain't coming no more. And the Lord said, it's cool. I'll find somebody. I'll find somebody who will let me give them some gifts. But it don't end there. And this is a part I love so much. The pathway whereby mercy and grace are multiplied is due to the failure of another. The Jews failed. And when they failed, mercy came to the Gentiles. So when we walk away from God and we leave our purpose, and I'm gonna, I want to remind you, I didn't know who would be here today. Had no clue who would be here today. I didn't get no text messages saying, preach it good, my family's coming. I didn't know who would be here today, but God did. So when we walk away from God, we leave our purpose and we leave our calling, we leave our very reason for living. That becomes the avenue whereby another is elevated into their calling, purpose, and reason for living. Then, come on to the music, baby. I'm pushing my luck right now. But then, when you see somebody working in your place, your place, you get mad at them. And you start putting the binoculars on their life. That's what was happening. That's what happened with the Jews and the Gentiles. And they were still struggling with it because Sister Maria O. Pedro was still shunning the Gentiles when the Jews came around a long time after Pentecost. So when you see God elevate somebody because you told him you were too busy, Then those that walk away become the enemy, as it were, of those they see function in their place. But the word says, but the word says, can't nobody take your place. Hmm. So wait a minute. You mean I've been mad at them because it looks like they're doing what I was supposed to be doing? But they really ain't. That's exactly what I'm saying. Go 
because God made you just like he wanted to make you. And he gave, he gave you some gifts. And he don't give gifts like we give gifts. He gives gifts according to his standards. And he had those gifts in mind for you before you were good. He didn't change his mind about you when you went bad. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Well, how about next verse, Sister Heidi? Can you give it to me? Lee says in verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching election, they are beloved for their father's sake. You know what that means? That means God made a God made a promise and he ain't going back on it. Look at this next verse. For the gifts, for the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. I'm going to keep my back to you right now because I really want to look at you, but I'm going to tell you something. When you come back, you ain't coming on parole. When you come back, you ain't coming on probation. And when you come back, you ain't got nothing to prove. Because I didn't gift you, I didn't take your gift, and I can't give it back. But the Lord said, <laughs> give me verse 30, give me verse 30. For as in times past, you didn't believe God either. But now, everybody say now. now. Have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Now verse 31. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy Oh, I remember when them was in the highway and they're in the byway and they was up front with their hands lifted up and God blesses them and God uses them and no longer have they become my enemy but the exhibition of the mercy of God in their life has now become an attractant. that through your mercy, they may also obtain mercy. You see, this ain't the way I wrote it up. This ain't the way I drew it up. This wasn't the way I planned it. Because, Brother Tripp, I messed up and I failed. And my reputation took a shot. So I gathered up everything and I sold it. And I eased on down, eased on down the road. But somewhere where I was at, Brother David, the Lord said, I still know you, boy. And I still got a calling on you, boy. And I still got a gifting on you, boy. And you can't be stupid enough to give it up. Preaching right here, Sister Leanne. Thirty two. For the Lord kept you hemmed up in your unbelief, so that when He moves on you, you know it wasn't nothing but mercy. Because you're going to come in here today and say, man, I really wasn't looking for repentance. I really wasn't looking for a turnaround. I was kind of just figured I was stuck where I was stuck. But the Lord said, look around you, hoss. Look around you, honey. Look around you, ma'am. Look around you, sir. You know what you see in operation? Mercy. Mercy. And they've learned not only to accept my mercy, they have learned to allow my mercy to flow through them. Get you some. Yeah. 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 Woo! Yeah. 
Woo! The power of the Holy Ghost just moved in here. And the Lord said, I've still been knowing you. And you haven't hid from me. And you haven't run from me. And I haven't changed my mind about you. So the Spirit, as you're standing, so the Spirit and the bride say, come. Whosoever will. We know his will. He's not willing that any perish. In your mind, you plan to come back to God someday. You plan to come back and be a servant. You plan to come back and fill a new place. But on the way down the road, you know what the Lord said? Y'all ain't ready for this, but I'm going to say it. The Lord said, hey, number one servant, go get his robe. Number two servant, go get his shoes. Number three servant, go get my ring. Because he's not a servant. He's clothed in something that was made for him. I'm ready to impart my authority. That's what the ring means, Brother David. I'm ready to impart my authority. The prodigal came home and said, I just want to be a servant. He didn't even get to tell daddy what his plan was because his father saw him coming a great way off and he ran to meet him and he already had a plan in mind. And you know what the plan was? Reconciliation. Restoration. Recovery. So today, I know I spoke to you. I'll shake your hand if you don't duck me when you leave. But you don't have to leave like you came. Now, my wife, I'm, I'm not asking you to come right this minute because my wife is getting ready to sing a song. And I'm going to tell you something. Before God Almighty, this lady is the best thing that has ever happened to me in my life. She loved me. She loved me as close to unconditionally as God loves me more than anybody. The Holy Ghost is using her anointing her and she's going to minister she's going to give the altar call here we go listen in the darkness where everything is unknown I face the power on, reconnect with it. of sin on my Find a way to heal my world. Hear me now, hear me. He said, He said that I could come into His presence without fear. Without fear. Into the holy place where His mercy never left. The mercy never left. I'm running. I'm running.
listen to it. Where everything is unknown. I didn't know. I face the power of sin on my own. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I did not know of a place I could go where I could find a way to heal my wounded soul. But he said, he said that I, I could come. come into his presence without fear, into the holy place where his mercy hovers near. I'm
the ship of your life is tossing on a sea of strife and you need someone if you feel so all alone and your house is not a home you need someone if it seems life isn't fair and there's no one left to share all those lonely days and nights when things won't turn out right and you want someone to care Just be there, you need someone. I give you Jesus. He's the peace that passes all understanding. I give you Jesus. He's the perfect love. If the pressure's all around, keep your spirits to the ground, and you need someone. If your body is in pain, and your health you can't Not only is God's gift so much more perfect and different than this world, but in that story, he looked for the son to come back. If we're positioning ourselves to be gifted, God loves us so much that he's looking for the opportunity to give us that gift. He's, he's searching out the opportunity to be able to give us something, to be able to bless us something. If we'll just position ourselves to receive it. Amen. Amen. Uh, such a, just a sweet spirit that's been in this place all day. And I believe that it's going to transition over as we leave even, that we're going to take this with us. 
and then we're going to see mighty things. Uh, we got quite a bit of announcements, so just bear with me. Men's prayer meeting is this Monday night at 6.30 p.m. Junior high camp, ages 12 through 15, is May 28th through the June 1st. A senior high camp, ages 15 to 18, is June 4th through the 8th. And both camps are $200 per camper. The parents must have their campers registered and paid through the link at moyouth.com by May 22nd. So that's the deadline to be able to sign up and register. Uh, please don't wait until the last minute to register. It's a lengthy process, and pastor has to sign off on his part, too. So don't put him rushing there at the end. Junior camp is ages 8 to 11. It's July 8th through the 12th. It's $170 per camper, and $25 is due by June 1st, and the remainder will be due when you leave. Please let Sister Casey know ASAP if you're going. Um, all camps are at Pinecrest Campground at Cherokee Pass. It's the same, work, the same place that it's been for several years now. Section 4 ladies meeting is Monday, May 20th at 7 p.m. at Jesus Name Tabernacle in Crothersville, Missouri. Taco bar and sweets. Games and prizes, $10 each. Uh, text GAMES, that's G-A-M-E-S, to the church number to register and pay. Focus prayer will be Saturday, May 25th, so there's a sign-up sheet in the back for that. Please sign it. I encourage you to sign it if you can. This, if you've never done it, this will be the time to do it. Uh, BBS is July 17th to the 19th, and the theme is Glow for Jesus. There is a box in the foyer for donations. Anything glow-related, glow sticks, neon glow in the dark, black plastic tablecloths, pool noodles and color balloons, and anything that's related to that, uh, feel free to get that. We are also asking for volunteers, so if you want to volunteer, text HELP to the church number and choose which category you'd like to help with. And to register your child, text GLOW to the church number. Amen. Do we have any birthdays and anniversaries this week? I don't know where my brother slipped off to. Garrison, you got any money? <laughs> okay, just everybody know he fell short today. <laughs> all right, we'll go ahead and do birthdays first. All y'all birthdays, stand and we'll sing to you. You uh, better stand. Happy birthday. Don't give her the microphone. <laughs> uh, I want to start off by saying it's kind of awkward giving a gift <laughs> after he just preached about giving gifts. So, uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is you matter. I think that's what the point was <laughs> when you give a gift. <laughs> Earlier today, I woke up early to get a bunch of stuff done, and it did not go the way I wanted it to. 
and uh, I was getting stuff ready just a second ago. Here, you take these. These are really heavy. <laughs> and I told Casey, I said, I just got too many jobs. And uh, as soon as I said it, I got to thinking about all the jobs that Sister Amanda, a.k.a. Dodd, has. And uh, if you don't know, I'm going to list a few. She sends a church text so y'all can stop sending them to me because I don't send them. <laughs> she does the ladies' night that she spends her own money for. That's not church money. She does that all herself, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. She plays the piano. She leads our music ministry. She's a mom herself. She's a mammy. And I've been, because she is my aunt, fortunate enough to sit at the table when Gigi gets phone calls and has to leave and when things don't go the way they're supposed to go because being a pastor comes first. And a lot of the times, Dodd's the one who has to suffer the blow the most. So besides being a mother to her own children, she's a mother to all of us too. And most of the time that gets overlooked because it's just life. But so today you matter. <laughs> and <laughs> just today, don't tomorrow. I'm not making any promises. <laughs> and we love you and are thankful that um, you're our pastor's wife. I love my mom, too. I, all my life is like a little boy. Dad was my best buddy, but mom was my best friend. And uh, it was, I remember going up to her when she was cooking and stuff, saying, Mom, I can't wait till I get older and we're just friends. But, uh, yeah, I love her. She does a lot. And uh, I'm thankful for her. Thankful for my mother-in-law, everything she does. My grandma. Like, we got a lot of, I'm blessed. I don't know about y'all, but I'm blessed. Amen. If you can, let's stand. And uh, Brother Ronnie, would you care to dismiss us in prayer? Father God, we thank you so much for this powerful message that we've heard today. Let it go to our minds and our hearts as we go straight, God, into this new year. We thank you for everything that you're doing in the midst of them. We thank you for the good things that you're doing today. We just ask that.